extremely pleased to be welcoming you to the installation of the second Kwame Nkrumah Chair in African Studies. In 2005, efforts by successive directors of the Institute and collaborators, knowledge about the role of Kwame Nkrumah in the Pan-Africanist movement and discourse, culminated in a decision by the University of Ghana to establish a Kwame Nkrumah Chair in African Studies. This endowed chair, the first, I believe, at the University of Ghana, was established with a twofold aim. One, to honor Nkrumah for his significant intellectual contributions to African thought and pan-Africanism, and two, to promote research teaching and the public promotion of Africana studies. The chair received most of its core funding from Anglo Gold Ashanti, and we are and continue to be extremely grateful. Thank you very much. Anglo Gold Ashanti also support an annual lecture on business in Africa. A partnership with Anglo Gold Ashanti, both through the Nkrumah chair as well as the annual lecture on business in Africa, is a major platform through which we promote knowledge on the peoples and cultures of Africa, as Nkrumah exhorted at the formal opening of the institute in 1963. Currently, we're taking that partnership even further. In 2012, several colleagues and myself visited Obwasi Township as guests of Anglo Gold Ashanti to get a feel of their work and its relationship to the Obwasi community. But more importantly, to begin a conversation about research in the community on issues that are directly associated with livelihoods and culture. Created in 2004 as a result of a merger between the former Ashanti Golds Company of Ghana and Anglo Gold Limited of South Africa, I'm especially pleased today because the Nkrumah Chair, Professor Gordon, has been a friend of the Institute since he first met us about two years ago. The Vice Chancellor will be introducing him to you shortly, but I must use this opportunity to share an insight into this man. I became deeply impressed with his level of commitment to the Africana agenda, and he made practical this um, commitment through his leadership and mentoring at the Institute. He shares generously of his time and expertise to support faculty and students, including reading our papers and giving us comments. He has been tireless in supporting us in grandmanship and um, encouraging me personally to do more at that level. And he has also been extremely gracious and patient with us. Before I introduce our chairman, I should like to thank the staff and colleagues of the Institute, as well as the Public Affairs Directorate for their hard work in putting tonight's program together. And we're very grateful also to Miss Victoria Wood of Anglo Gold Ashanti, who has been a part of getting this show on the road. On behalf of the Institute, I would like to say that we are particularly grateful to the Vice Chancellor for chairing this evening's event. From here, he will be heading straight to the airport, so he has um, exhorted us to make sure that we stick to time. And if he ha has to slip out, you will understand why. We know his presence here underscores his commitment to the Institute and the African Studies agenda, and we will hear more about that tonight. So let me introduce now our Chairman and Vice Chancellor um, to you. Professor Enes Aite, Vice Chancellor of the University of Ghana, is a professor of economics. Prior to his appointment as Vice Chancellor, he was a senior fellow and director of the Africa Growth Initiative at the Brookings Institution in Washington, DC. He was also director of the Institute of Statistical, Social, and Economic Research, ISA, of the University of Ghana, Lagon, for the period February 2003 to January 2010. Professor Aite was educated at Achimota School from 1968 to 73, and at the Presbyterian Boys Secondary School at Legon, 1973 to 75. He studied economics with statistics, 75 to 78, at the University of Ghana, and then took a master's degree in regional planning at the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology, in Kumasi, from 79 to 81. He then obtained a doctor engineer at the University of Dortmund, Germany, in 1985. Professor Aite's areas of specialization are in development economics. He was elected as a fellow of the Ghana Academy of Arts and Sciences in 2009. After teaching on the spring program at the University of Dortmund for a year, Professor Aite returned to Ghana in 1986. Sorry? Yes. The Vice Chancellor wants me to tr truncate this, but I think I can, I can make it fast. Um, if there's anything I think that is unimportant, I will, I will leave it out. He, he started work at ISA in 1986, was promoted Senior Research Fellow in 1990, Associate Professor in 97, and full Professor in 2000. Professor Aite taught at the Department of 
of economics um, here at Legon from 86 to 92, and has also been a lecturer at the School of Oriental and African Studies, the University of London, and professor at Yale, um, and a number of other places, Cornell, and so forth. Prof. Saite's research work focuses on the economics of development with interest in institutions and their role in development, regional integration, economic reforms, financial systems in support of development, and small enterprise development. He's very well known, I am sure to most of you, for his work on informal finance and microfinance in Africa. And he has consulted for various organizations, both locally and internationally, on these subjects, and presented his papers at scores of universities around the world, including, including many of the big names, such as Oxford, um, Harvard, Yale, New York, um, Los Angeles, Georgetown, um, and Tokyo, to name but a few. Prof. Saite has published three books, five edited volumes, 32 journal articles, and over 100 conference working and discussion papers. Among his publications are Financial Integration and Development in Sub-Saharan Africa, which was published by Rutledge in 1998, and Economic Reforms in Ghana, The Miracle and the Mirage, James Curry, 2000. His latest publication is with Chris Addy in the American Economic Review, Papers and Proceedings of May 2010. He was the second recipient of the Michael Bruno Award of the World Bank to become a visiting scholar for May to October in 1998. Prof. Saite was the president of the Ghana Institute of Planners from 98 to 2000. He's currently the chairman of the board of the United Nations University World Institute for Development Economics Research in Helsinki. He's board member of the Global Development Network in New Delhi and also of the Center for Development Research at the University of Bonn in Germany. He was previously a member of the program committee of the African Economic Research uh, Consortium, Nairobi, 2000 to 2009, and has been associated with this committee since 1988. He was a managing editor of the Journal of African Economics and is currently a member of the editorial board of Development Southern Africa and of African Development Review and was until recently the editor of the new Legon Observer and we may have to ask him what's happening to the new Legon Observer. Prof. Saite is a non-executive director of Stanback, Stanbic Bank Ghana Limited, Limited and was priest's warden of Christ Anglican Church in Legon from 2003 to 10. He's married to Dr. Ellen Bote Doku Aite, and they have two children, James Niyama and Felicia Nadede. And um, I'd like you to join me, please, in welcoming our Vice Chancellor and Chairman for tonight's occasion. Thank you very much, Director. Pro Vice Chancellor for Academic and Student Affairs, Registrar. Director of the Institute of African Studies, our colleagues from Anglo Gold Ashanti, Nananum, Nime, Name, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I'm very pleased to be a part of this event this afternoon, an event that holds so much significance for this university. I'm very happy for three main reasons. The first being the significance of the Kwame Nkrumah Chair to this university. The second being the theme, winning, for, winning the future for African studies in Africa. And then finally, the man speaking to us. He offers us a lot of hope and inspiration as we pursue African studies at the University of Ghana. Before I introduce you, let me talk briefly about the significance of the Carbon Chroma Chair to this university. There are two reasons why, as a university, we should find that significant. The first being the man himself, Osage for Dr. Kwame Nkrumah. He occupies not only in this university, not only in Ghana, not only in Africa, but throughout the world, a major place, a major place for us as intellectuals, and a major place for us as Africans, and how we see development. So if this university is interested in development, then we should be interested by default in what he stood for, in terms of trying to restructure African economies, especially ours in Ghana here. So as we begin to think about how we can make Ghana a better place, 
and how we can make Africa a much better place. We have no choice but to think about the things he stood for. Whenever we think about industrial policy, whenever we think about faster growth in Africa, whenever we think about agriculture being transformed, we have no choice but to think about how Kwame Nkrumah understood these things. So it's our expectation that an institute of African studies with the Kwame Nkrumah chair will be looking to see how his ideals today stand out. How are they perceived today by scholars of Africa? And how will this influence development debates into the future? So it's appropriate that the University of Ghana has a chair named after him, and a chair that has so far been occupied by distinguished scholars. I'm very pleased that we can associate with that. The University of Ghana has been interested in creating research chairs. And the Kwame Nkrumah chair is the first of such. The other chairs that we have, one at the business school, endowed by the Institute of Chartered Accountants of Ghana, and then the Benciential Chair at the Medical School. It's our expectation that there will be many more such chairs devoted to producing scholarly work of a very high standard that will make this university proud. So today, we are gathered here to listen to one of the things that make it important for us as a university to pursue many of these chairs. It is our hope and our expectation that with time, there will be other sponsors for similar chairs in other disciplines at the University of Ghana. The theme of winning the future for African studies in Africa is one that is very dear to my heart. Winning the future for African studies. African studies is often perceived as something that is pursued in American universities, not in African universities. But there isn't a better place for pursuing African studies than in Africa. I am very happy that uh, Kwame Nkrumah found it appropriate and fitting to support this university to create an institute for African studies. It's obvious to all of us that with the growing poverty in this region, with the challenges that scholarship faces in Africa, with the difficulties that African scholars have faced over the years, we haven't supported African studies so much in this part of the world. So I'm happy that our lecturer will be devoting a lot of attention to how we can win the future for African studies, how we can promote African studies in a much more significant way than we have done as universities in the region. And then finally, I talk about the man himself, Professor Emeritus Jacob U. Gordon. I didn't know him until a few months ago when uh, the Director of Institute of African Studies brought him to my office to introduce him. It was supposed to be a brief visit, but we ended up spending much longer than I had planned. But I enjoyed it. It was totally enjoyable. The man amazed me with his understanding of scholarship in Africa. I was quite happy to see that he was a cousin not too far away from here. Came from, uh, even though he came from the US, very much linked to us in this part of Africa. So I have this bio of him that I'm going to read out. I believe you also have copies. Jacob U. Jacob U. Gordon, PhD in African History, LLD, ME African History, serves as the Kwame Nkrumah Chair at the Institute of African Studies at the University of Ghana for the period 2012-2013. He is Professor Emeritus at the University of Kansas, USA. He received his primary and secondary school education in Nigeria before his selection as a Haile Selassie scholar to study at the University of Addis Ababa, 1959. He left Ethiopia for the United States in 1960 and completed his undergraduate education at Bethune, Cookman University, received his, the master's degree at Harvard University, and earned his PhD from Michigan State University. He completed postdoctoral work in gerontology at the University of Southern California, and was awarded the Honorary Doctor of Laws from the Union Theological Seminary. 
Over more than 40 years in higher education, Professor Gordon has devoted his career to African studies and the black experience in the diaspora, specializing in the US, Brazil, South America, and the Caribbean. He has authored or edited 20 books, more than 30 referee journals, 25 research papers, 12 book chapters, 10 monographs, 25 research reports, numerous abstracts, training manuals, and over 75 presentations. Professor Gordon received about $4.5 million in research and community service grants during his tenure at the University of Kansas. During his teaching career, Professor Gordon taught more than 8,000 college students and served on or chaired 32 doctoral dissertations and master's thesis. He continues to mentor many former students who are now leaders in their professional careers. Professor Gordon's administrative experiences include Chairman of the Department of History and Political Science, Albany State University in Georgia, that's 1967 to 1970. Founder and Chairman of the Department of African and African American Studies at the University of Kansas, that's from 1970 to 1980. Executive Director of the Center for Leadership at the University of Kansas, 1980 to 2004, and currently as President and Chief Executive Officer of American Health Coalition Incorporated, a nonprofit organization promoting health worldwide. Professor Gordon is a recipient of many awards and honors, including Who We Sue Among Black Americans, University of Kansas Faculty Outstanding Public Service Award, Contemporary Authors Award, Phi Alpha Theta National Honor Society Award in History, Director of American Scholars, Fulbright Senior Specialist, and the establishment of the Jacob U. Gordon Collection in the University of Kansas Research Library. He is currently working on two research projects, the African Presidential Libraries and the Traditional African Leaders past, present, and the future. So, ladies and gentlemen, from the brief bio that I've read, it's obvious that we have a distinguished scholar in African studies to speak to us. We are very grateful that he accepted to sit in the Kwame Nkrumah chair, or occupy the Kwame Nkrumah chair. We are grateful to him for agreeing to speak to us today as we install him as the second occupant of the Kwame Nkrumah chair in African studies at the Institute of African Studies. Many thanks. I apologize for uh, pushing in here, and, uh, Professor, but it is the role of a sponsor to, uh, to acknowledge our position and also to endeavor to encourage other institutions to support such a wonderful university. So Professor Ernest Allente, Vice-Chancellor of the University of Ghana and Chairman of this occasion, uh, Professor Akosia Ampofo, uh, Director of the Institution of African Studies, Dr. Mercy Ancrofo Ansa, Research Fellow of the Institute of African Studies, Professor Jacob Gordon, Heads of Department and Faculty Members, Distinguished Invited Guests, our Traditional Leaders, Friends from the Media and Ladies and Gentlemen. On behalf of the Board, Management and the staff of Anglo Gold Ashanti in Ghana, I'm delighted to have been invited to participate at the installation of the second occupant of the Kwame Nkomo Chair, Professor Jacob Gordon. Anglo Gold Ashanti is proud of its sixth year association with the Chair. In line with this evening's theme, Winning the Future for African Studies, as an African company, Anglo Gold Ashanti is privileged to be able to contribute to the deepening of the knowledge in this area of studies. 
I'm happy to say that today's event marks another step for Anglo Gold Ashanti growing a relationship with the Institution of African Studies. This began in September 2007 with the formal launch of the Kwame Nkoma Chair. Anglo Gold Ashanti initially provided $400,000 uh, support towards the chair and continues to fund the annual lectures on business in Africa today. Lectures have been delivered by leading big business figures in Africa, including uh, Bobby Gotsfall, the ex-CEO of Anglo Gold Ashanti, who delivered the inaugural lecture, Mr. Mark Kurtafani, uh, CEO of Anglo Gold Ashanti, and soon to be the CEO uh, of Anglo American here in Africa. Tony Oting Yesi, former chairman of the University Council, and more recently last year, Mr. Tito Murabini, former governor of the Bank of South Africa and chairman of Anglo Gold Ashanti. We look forward today to this year's lecture. Anglo Gold Ashanti engages the Institute of African Studies in other collaborative research activities. Recently, uh, as the director highlighted, a delegation from the university visited with us in a reconnaissance trip to Abwasi to explore the possibilities of research into socio-artistic aspects of the mining industry and community life in Abwasi. There will be many opportunities to explore projects of mutual interest to the university and to the company. Anglo Gold Ashanti is committed to promoting study and research opportunities through the long-term partnerships with key educational establishments. Anglo Gold Ashanti's work with the Institute of African Studies has continued support of the chair, reflects its commitment to development in education and business in Africa in line with uh, Kwame Nkoma's vision. Again, I am delighted to welcome and congratulate Professor Gordon on his appointment to the chair at this landmark time of the Institute's history. I am reliably informed that the Institute of Af African Studies is celebrating its 50th anniversary this year. Anglo Gold Ashanti held its own Diamond Jubilee celebration last year for the uh, Anglo Gold Ashanti schools at Abwasi. The company has also built seven other schools in five districts around our mines at Abwasi and at Idiwapriem near Takwa. Recent initiatives range from financing teacher training support at Idiwapriem to providing school minibuses computers and other equipment to junior and senior high schools uh, when we launched the Anglo Gold Ashanti Community Trust Funds earlier this year. Celebrations aside, this is a testimony to the company's commitment and belief that education is the key to the social and economic development of the communities and countries in which we operate. One of Anglo Gold Ashanti's values is to make communities where we operate better off for us being there. Education is clearly one, of the achieve, one way of achieving this for the long and sustainable term. In Ghana, the company com provides technical skills training to communities where we operate. In higher education, we have long-standing partnerships for employee training with institutions including the Ghana Institute of Management and the Public Administration and the University of Cape Town in South Africa. Anglo Gold Ashanti makes significant investments in capacity building, training and skills development. These programs are developed to provide and generate employment opportunities for people in the communities in which we operate, not only in mining, but in the multi-economic sectors. 
at a regional and as a regional and pan African level, a Anglo Gold Ashanti supported the launch of the African Minerals Skills Initiative, partnering with the United Nations Economic Commissions of Africa. The initiative aims to support the African mining vision by focusing on broad skills development in Africa in relation to the mineral sector and supporting the locally de delivery of skills and opportunities throughout selected African mining schools. This sums up Anglo Gold Ashanti is aligned with Kwame Nkoma's vision for Africa. As a representative of Anglo Gold Ashanti, an African company which has significant international operations. I'm delighted that we are able to work with the Institute of African Studies at the University of Ghana by supporting the Kwame Nkrumah Chair. This evening's focus is education and pursuit of excellence. This is one area in which Anglo Gold Ashanti strives to be a partner in a social and economic environment of the countries in which we operate. The company makes significant investments in many other areas, including infrastructure projects and healthcare. Once again, congratulations to Professor Gordon on his appointment. Thank you for inviting me to, spend, uh, to speak and give me the opportunity to be part of the installation event of this evening. Thank you. It is time for the installation, and this will be performed by the Vice Chancellor, assisted by the Director of the Institute, Professor Kusi Adumako Ampofu, and also the first occupant of the Kwame Komache, Professor Kufi Anido.
just through the University of Ghana have benefited the institute. Another dear man come and boy, and then I benefit and I see who don't say. Say I depart, I was here to ask you. First of all, let me say good evening. I appreciate your presence at this momentous occasion. I looked back and I heard a voice, you are your own. Everybody's gone. I want to say a special thank you to Mr. Vice Chancellor, Professor Yeti and all the former members of the platform, the uh, traditional leaders. I just finished a book on traditional leaders, so I appreciate your presence. And all the dignitaries that are present here, students, the Ghana Dance Assembly is always beating my heart when I hear them play. I didn't know that Ghana was this hospitable. If I knew, I would have asked to be born in Ghana. But that's history now. I am indeed pleased and honored to serve as the second occupant of the Kwame Nkrumah Chair in African Studies here at the Institute of African Studies. Let me also add that I'm really honored and also very glad to come here and occupy this chair as the first American Africanist of African descent. Now they say we are from the diaspora. But when I left Lagos, I have always kept Africa in my mind. I never forgot where I came from. Today, I want to invite you to go on a short journey with me to revisit what I consider to be the centerpiece of Kwame Krumans' very many legacies. That's education. And to be more specific, African studies. But please excuse me on a personal level. I am very happy to even regard myself as one of Kwame Nkrumah's legacies. I know that his oldest son, Dr. Francis, is present with us, and thank you for coming. You recall that in 1958, just after Ghana's independence, Dr. Kwame Krumah conveyed the first Pan-African Conference in Accra. 
All previous conferences from 1900 to 1945 were held outside Africa. It was Kwame Nkrumah who brought it home. It was at that conference in Accra that brought in heads of state. There were very few then that were independent, including Hayes Selassie. It was at that conference Hayes Selassie offered to all African students willing to come and study amid requirements to study in Addis Ababa. I was one of the first recipients of that scholarship. Left Lagos, I thought that Addis Ababa was somewhere close to Jericho. Well, here I was, landed in Addis Ababa. From that day on, I knew I owed my higher education to Kwame Nkrumah. If not for him, I probably would have stayed in Nigeria and died in the Civil War. He, so he saved my life and he gave me the chance to pursue higher education. He made me Pan-Africanist. Even my master's thesis at Howard, I wrote on Pan-Africanism. That's what I got from him, so I owe that to him. Winning the future for African studies in Africa. In 2004, I wrote a volume entitled African Studies for the 21st Century. I was writing for the American and Western people to understand what we have to do to make African studies more relevant. Today, I want to focus, for the short time I have, on Africa itself. I want to begin by quoting from Professor Francis Agbokeda's work in the history of the University of Ghana, which was published in 1998. And I quote, from the very beginning, the Institute of African Studies, University of Ghana, was intended to be Ghana's main focus on Africa, as well as its influence and role of our peoples throughout the world. He went on to say that the Institute was established to do at least two things. One, to provide a focus for research and postgraduate teaching in African studies in universities and higher institutions of Ghana. And two, to provide a center for research workers in African studies in Ghana, as well as a base for affiliated scholars and postgraduate students from other universities engaged in field work. It is also important to note that President Kwame Nkrumah did not fail to charge the Institute of African Studies with the pursuit of Pan-African ideals by eliminating colonial influence in African studies, by extending the areas of the study of peoples of African descent in the Americas and Caribbean, and by coordinating with institutes and centers of African studies in other African states to produce an extensive and diversified African classic library. Those were the charges. So it is against this brief background that I propose to revisit with you President Nkrumah's most important legacy, that of African studies. Not just for Ghana, he said, or for West Africa, but for the whole of Africa. So based upon our findings in this study, I hope to present to you a roadmap to make this legacy a fait accompli for Africa in the 21st century. 
21st century and perhaps even beyond 21st century. Those I have entitled, as I indicated, my title of discussion to be winning the future for Africa, uh, African studies in Africa. That is very dear to my heart. We suggest that any meaningful discourse about this subject, we must raise a minimum of four questions. First, what is African studies? Two, what is the current state of African studies? And three, what is the relevance of African studies, especially in African universities? And four, what are some key imperatives for winning the future of African studies in Africa? Let's address the first question, what is African studies? To define African studies is a long story, but I'm going to try to summarize it. Looking at the literature, it appears that we have two schools of thought. One I have labeled a Eurocentric school of thought, which defined African studies only in what they called Black Africa or Africa proper. Egypt was not a part of Africa, and the list goes on. All of that definition is based upon your strength attitude towards Africa and people of African descent, the 17th, 18th, 19th century, and even the 21st century. The second school of thought in trying to define African studies is what I have labeled Afrocentric school of thought. This is a school of thought that agrees with Dr. Kwame Nkrumah. He studied the whole of Africa, East, North, West, Egypt, all of them are Africa. Last time I checked with my wife who's a geographer, I think Egypt is still a part of Africa. And also to study the African diaspora, the Africans who left here even before the slave trade, those who left during the slave trade, and those of us who were lucky enough to fly to the diaspora. Others were not that lucky. They went by sea and never returned. And so that's the way we want to look at African study, the study of Africa and peoples of African descent. So in defining what African studies actually is, I'd like to suggest to you that we may define it as a formally organized multidisciplinary academic study of the continent of Africa and peoples of African descent, wherever they may be. African study itself has its own structure. Some structures take the form of institute, some are schools or colleges, some are centers, for the most part that's what we have in the United States, others are departments. That is usually the structure of African studies. Let's take a look at the conceptual dimensions of African studies. What are these? We like to suggest that African studies is three-dimensional. It is about the production of knowledge. It's about the dissemination of knowledge. And it's also about application of knowledge. So it is three-dimensional. And right at the center, we suggest that African studies must be Africa-centered. It must be viewed within the context of the African environment, institutions, what I call STEM, and worldviews and value systems. And there are many examples of all of these that we can talk about. Now, I want to break it down to look at these three dimensions the functional dimensions, the production of knowledge, knowledge dissemination, and how we go doing that, not just by teaching, and the application of knowledge. But we haven't done too well, and that was my thesis in my volume, African Studies for the 21st Century, in the area of application. There's what I call knowledge and doing gap. It's a gap between 
knowledge and what we actually do in practice. And so that presents a great deal of problem in trying to understand African studies. Later on, we will show to you some good examples of how to apply knowledge to make it useful. Now, we also have to understand the historical perspectives of African studies. It didn't just start yesterday. I submit to you that African studies is just as old as Africa itself, as a human race. And I have examined six factors, what I call contributing factors to the development of African studies. The first six contribute factors to the history of African studies is what I call the early studies of ancient Africa. Early studies. People have been studying Africa for a long time. People traveled. I have a few examples to give to you. A lot of African historians, African geographers, including the following. Albert, 1014 to 1094. Great Arab geographer. Studied Africa very well. Manetho of the third century was known to be a historian of Egypt. Ibn Battuta, 1304 to 1369. Ahmad Baba, right here in Mali, 1556, 1627. Al-Khadun, another great scholar, 1333, 1406. And even our famous Lua Africanus from Guyana. That's one very early what we know about African studies. They didn't call it African studies then. They were just studying Africa. The second contributing factor was the racial attitudes of Western scholars toward Africa and the darker races, as Du, as du Bois put it, the color line. There are examples everywhere. Those of you who have been to Europe, you can still feel it. But I want to suggest at least three for you if you don't already, if you're not already familiar with them. The first one was a man was called, it was a knight, Sir Harry Johnson in 1899. In his study, he suggested that Africans were born to be slaves. They couldn't do any better. There's no way you can tame them to be human. They had to be dealt with as slaves. Even in 1923, A. Pugh Neaton was speaking to the Royal Society in London. And the subject was history, uh, Africa in historical studies, was his topic. And this journal was published in 1923, in which he suggested there was no such thing as African history until Europeans got there. Even the great scholar, those of you who are historians, and I told him, I was in graduate school when he died. Some of us said, thank God. He wrote about seven volumes of history. Great British historian, told him. And he concluded, there was no place in all history, in all historical movements, that Africans and black people have made any significant contribution to all human history. These were these examples of Western scholars' attitude towards Africa and peoples of African descent. Even in the 20th century, scholars wrote the bell curve from Harvard about the inherent inferiority of Africans and peoples of African descent. And reactions to all of these have to stimulate the study of African and African studies. The third contributing factor was the search for the origin of human species. The search for the origin of human species that gave rise to interest. Great discoveries, L.S.B. Leakey, King Apitakos Africanus, and lately Nadi. All of these great archaeologists help us to understand the African past, which was very critical in knowing about the present. The fourth one was the Pan-African movement. A movement which was started by a West Indian barrister at law in the UK, 
H. Sylvester Williams, 1900, in which he invited Du Bois and some African-American scholars to come to UK for this conference. And thereafter, by 1919, W.E.B. Du Bois, the first black man to receive a PhD in history from Harvard, took over the Pan-African movement and laid down the foundation. And Krumah came across that, became a part of that. And so the last conference in uh, Manchester, 1945, Krumah was there and brought the idea back home. The struggle for African independence and the ultimate creation of a USA. I mean, United States of Africa. The fifth contributing factor was the legacies of World War II, which created the Cold War. Competition between the West and the East gave rise to trying to understand this giant we call Africa. And so there was great competition. People like Ford Foundation invested a lot of money first to do some research, which led to the development of African studies in the U.S. And before you know it, by 1957, U.S. created uh, the Asso African Studies Association, ASA, which is the largest, largest in the world. And so the Cold War was a part of all of that. The sixth and the last one was the reassertion of African uh, descendants uh, in the New World. Uh, and it's a long list of them who really helped uh, to promote the study of Africa because these great scholars were interested in knowing something about their own homeland, which is Africa. And that movement was led by Karaji Woodson. And as I speak, the month of February, we celebrate what we call black history, African history in the US. And that was led by Kataji Woodson, the second black man to get a PhD in history from Harvard. Woodson created the Association for the Study of African Life and History in 1915, and the celebration of the contributions of black people to world history began then. That association, in my judgment, is the oldest academy for the study of Africa and Africans. And so these are some uh, factors that led into the, the interest in the study of Africa, and each of these could become a book on, on its own right. Now I want to look at some of these examples of application. I, call, I don't know if you have that, uh, but you find that under the functional dimensions of African studies. I give about four examples of application because we are weak in that area, and I can only tell you what I'm familiar with, what I know. There could be others, many other places. I talk about the Silicon Valley, which is a part of Stanford University for application of new ideas that are implemented. It's done, and you are very familiar with Silicon Valley. We talk about Richard Triangle at the University of North Carolina, where they do application of knowledge, theories, Talking about round one, uh, Route 128 that belongs to Harvard for application of knowledge. And of course, IFAS, Institute for Food and Agricultural Sciences, the University of Florida. I carefully selected all of these to demonstrate that the study of Africa or African studies is not limited to literature and history and sociology. It involves all disciplines that we know of. Next slide. Now I want to talk about, I uh, ask the question, what is the state of African studies? I'm putting this in a global context, the state of African studies. Do I have the right slide? OK. I'm very happy to report to you that the state of African studies is very strong everywhere in the world except Africa. I'm really not happy. It's very sad. So let me talk about Africa, African studies in the Americas. Okay? The Ford Foundation led the way. And by 1957, ASA was created, the largest professional organization in the world on Africa. Thousands of people are members. A lot of you probably here have already attended the ASA uh, in, in, in the United States. And that was a big struggle to, to make ASA relevant to Africa. Those of us who were in the U.S. who happened to be black, whether they came from Africa yesterday or before, uh, we were in struggle uh, about the control or the direction 
of ASA. We had a battle in Montreux in 1968. We almost, the war almost broke loose to control the direction of African studies. But African studies is very strong in the US. There are, it has become a national, um, what do you call it? A project, a defense project. This year there are about 12 centers in the US, centers of excellence, that are completely funded through what we call Title VI from US defense budget. It's a defense issue. We know about the giant of Africa. We want to study every language. I can, everything is taught in, in the US more than anywhere else I know. Any African language, even including Pidgin English, is taught in these centers. There are more than 100 centers in the US where the Center for Excellence, carefully selected for competition and for full funding by the US government. See, very there. Foundations, everybody is there. Whether it's Carnegie, Ford Foundation, all that money is there. The private sector, they are all there because they know what it is uh, to study Africa. In Canada, in 1962, they had a committee. In 1970, they created the ASA, Association of African Studies, in Canada. I believe Brazil is very much interested. I was there on African studies, and they are developing programs now in Brazil. Brazil happens to be the second largest country in the world of peoples of African descent. So African study is thriving, it's really thriving in the Americas. In Europe, there is also African Studies Association in UK, which started, I believe, 1963. There are African studies in Asia, African studies, Japan, everywhere you have African studies. Schools, the London School of Oriental and African Studies, Oriental Studies there, I believe, 1916, African Studies, 1938. It's a school. Now I come to my dear Africa, which is in my heart. The AAU, the Association of African Universities, published a book that contains 950 public universities in Africa, 950. I got my research assistants to go through it, we comb it. We were trying to find out what is the state of African studies in this continent. I can't tell you what you already know. Kwame Krumah has the foresight that I've never read in history. And I've been reading history for almost 50 years. The foresight to create African studies at Legon. It is unbelievable. Even what he laid down 50 years to come, I don't think he would have done it. That's how fast started he was. Out of 950 universities in the continent, we have less than 3%, 3% that have African Studies Institutes with degree programs. I can tell you all fair, three or four of the best in the continent. IAS is one of them. That's why I chose to come here. Ibadan is one of them. University of Cape Town is one of them. The rest of them is maybe Jume Kanta University just died. Cairo has one. Ethiopia had one, started one 207. In the 1950s, Ethiopia developed 
Institute for Ethiopian Studies. University of Nigeria and Tsutsuka now has one. I can just count it. And there is no ASA in Africa, ladies and gentlemen. There is no African Studies Association in Africa. And I think you should be very proud to have the director of the Institute for African Studies, Professor Pompo, who is now providing leadership to create an ASA in Africa this year. Give her a good hand. We have met in Cape Town, planning is going on, it has to be done. That was the dream, the legacy of Kwame Nkrumah. Don't limit African studies to Ghana, to West Africa. It's the whole of Africa and the African desert. That dream is coming through. So that is the state of African studies in Africa. What is the relevance of African studies? I have been asked this question, especially in African universities. Some of them will suggest we don't need African studies because we are all Africans. And being Africans, that's fine. I have an analogy. I used to tell black students in the United States, they had the same argument. They said, we are black people, we have soul, so we know black history. And I asked them, if you have toothache, and you really have gone through the experience of bad toothache, does that make you a dentist? I don't think so. I believe, last time I checked, you have to study dentistry. You have to study African history, African geography, African sociology, all those traditional disciplines. The relevance of African studies is very obvious. It is an industry for knowledge production. It also disseminates that information, and it tries to apply that knowledge for national development. For me, African studies has many dimensions. It's individual, it's organizational. Someone asked me this morning, radio talk show, what motivates you? Why are you in African studies? I say it's very simple. I want to know who I am. It's about identity. Because, ladies and gentlemen, without the knowledge of our African past, we can understand how we got where we are and how we can become what we can become. So for me, it's a prerequisite to establishing individual and national identity. That's the relevance. It's tied to national development. Nkrumah knew that. I had an interview with Professor Nketiah. I said, why are you playing music and the rest of them? Why are you doing traditional things? to bring people together to focus on national development. It's that, that simple. Music brings people together. Doesn't matter what language you speak. I can dance to it, even if I can sing. So on the personal level, on the personal level, African studies, as we define it, is very critical. It involves national development. Let me give you an example in terms of application. What is just happening right here in Accra? I read about the tragedy in the Bush Highway. And you know the history, how it was developed. Most of the work was done by engineers. The real African studies application would have said, we have an engineer, we have a sociologist, we have a historian, we have a geographer, and other related disciplines to sit down and plan that highway they would have studied the implication of that highway and avoid all these deaths. But it wasn't done that way. That is the relevance of African studies. 
It also has international dimension, the intra-Africa connection that Nkrumah talked about. We are surrounded by Francophone countries. How do we get to know them? How do we realize this dream of Africa must unite? The creation of the United States of Africa, if we don't understand each other. It just won't happen. For me, it's about human capital development. It contributes to the mission of the university. You want to become a world-class university? World-class university? How does that sound like? Without, for example, one of the greatest scholars of music, ethnomusicology. When I was looking for a great musicologist in the 80s in Kansas, I looked for Ghana and brought Professor Nketia as Lassie Hughes' professor. That's what we did. That's international connection to be a great world-class university. Now I want to talk very quickly. I know the time is moving. And this is really the very essence of my presentation. We know where we have come from. We know where we are. We're not doing too well in the continent. The question then is, what are some of the key imperatives for winning this future? We must win this future. One, we must develop what I call Africa-centered curriculum. Echo, are you with the key imperatives? Good. Africa-centered curriculum. Everywhere I travel to, I still see legacies of colonialism. There are some of us who still prefer to be ruled by colonialists. That's unfortunate. But we are not surprised. Krumah told us that. We are aware of neocolonialism. Neocolonialism doesn't mean just only Europeans. Some of them are with us. They're in collaboration with the outside neocolonialist. So they rather read Chaucer and Shakespeare than Lassen Hughes or in Fellerley or other great African writers. So their minds are still not decolonized. One of the great challenges that Nkrumah gave to the Institute was to make sure that you eradicate the influences of colonial masters from African studies. He was not ashamed of that. I call that Africanization. But that's who we are. Our education should be centered around us. And it must be multidisciplinary. The best practices in African studies must be multidisciplinary. You can teach a class on African history in history department. That's wonderful. You can teach a course in geography about African geography, regional geography. That's fantastic. But that's not what we call African studies. Those are single disciplines. It's when we bring them together that we begin to see the picture of African studies. To focus on the continent requires multidisciplinary approach. So inherently in African studies is the multidisciplinary nature of African studies. It's also imperative that we have capable leadership and governance structure in African studies. Capable leadership and governance structure. There must be resources. If you really want to develop world-class African studies, those people who are familiar with my uh, thing at IAS will tell you I'm very crazy about having good libraries. Good libraries. And that was what Nkrumah said 50 years ago. Libraries, classical. Without libraries, there's, there's no knowledge. And that's a big challenge in the continent. I have to be honest with you. We don't have good libraries in the continent of Africa. 
We all fly to U.S. and London for the materials they took from here. Either they bought it, they stole it, or something, and build big libraries over there. And we are here running around looking for those materials in the UK and the United States. And they are here. Because no one has paid serious attention to the preservation of our history and our heritage. We got to produce leaders with vision. Remember, the good book says what? A people without a vision will do what? We perish. We can't afford that. It is therefore imperative that we create that vision. We need sustainable linkages with other great universities, whether it's in Ghana or Africa or outside Africa. Linkages are very, very critical. We need inclusion of the African diaspora as we define it. Krumah told us that we have to understand Africans in the diaspora. They will always be a part of African heritage. They have much to contribute to the continent and they have much to gain in their home. African studies must strive to have areas of specialization. It doesn't do you any good to have five PhDs without specialization. We are thinking about the global economy. You got to be able to carry your degree from one village to another, from one town to another, from one country to another, and it's valuable. So we got to specialize. We can't afford to have African studies without language requirement. We can't assume that because we're Africans, we can speak all African languages. Language is critical. It is fundamental to preservation of our culture. And it must be autonomous. There has to be an autonomous organizational structure for African studies if we are to win the future. You can't just throw it up and down. There has to be an Africa-centered research theories. Every time I visit African universities, I try to attend seminars. And 99.9% .9 I'm still listening to European theories. I'm getting tired of it. So do me a favor. Go back to ancient Africa. If you don't read anything, read some of our proverbs. We get some insight to theories. And I can give you many examples right now. Ubuntu is a theory, it's a concept. It's an African conceptual framework for understanding what it is to be a human being. What is it to be a human being? It has principles. And there are many, many like that in our ancient past that we can use. Cultural competency is very important. We can't assume because we have African heritage, therefore we are culturally competent. Cultural competency is three-dimensional. It's your attitude, it's your knowledge, it's your skill to deal with any African community. We need those three. Your knowledge of the community, your attitude, and your skill. Lastly, but not the least, this sounds like a dirty word, I call it advocacy. There has to be advocacy. If you don't tell who you are, if you wait to be discovered, nobody's going to discover you. We have to beat our own drums. We call that educating civil society. Let them know who we are and what we do. I want to show you a picture of what I call the best practice model. Echo, you have that? That big circle. Right at the center is what we call African Studies Institute. And this is not original with me. Nkrumah even talked about this. All around it are disciplines. Disciplines where you can draw people who have the expertise in Africa. 
whether it's geography or sociology or literature. But the center is the, what controls that will. They all come to this institute to do multidisciplinary research or interdisciplinary research to focus on African unique problems that cannot be solved by one discipline. I love history. Those of our historians, we think we are the only discipline in the whole world. That's not true. There are many other disciplines. And we depend upon all these multi disciplines to make African studies very unique and very useful. The economist. You can be at your corner doing economics, but when you come to the institute, you interface with sociologists. You interface with psychologists something you are not trained to understand about human behavior. All problems are not solved through econometrics. You can't box everything into data. And that's the essence of African studies. This model allows you to do many things. You really are able to mobilize all university resources to engage in multidisciplinary research, in knowledge creation, dissemination, and application. That is the value of this model. We call it break practice because we know it has worked in other nations. And this model also fosters collaboration. Collaboration, it provides opportunities for joint academic appointments and course cross-listing all over the campus. It's Africanized, the Africanization of the curriculum to deal with our problems. It's about us. I know my time is moving very fast. I'm going to try to summarize what I tried to present to you, and then we have a Q&A session. In trying to close, I raise the question, where do we go from here? So we come from yesterday, today, we are talking about the future. Where do we go from here? Now, it's very simple. Wherever we decide we want to go, one thing is for sure. Africa is transitioning very rapidly. And for that transition to become successful, we have to create an intellectual foundation. That's the challenge for African scholars, especially for the Africanists. We have to create an intellectual foundation for that transformation. Whether we do it or not, there is transformation already going on. It will continue. But for the transformation to become successful, we have to create an intellectual foundation for that transformation. And so, ladies and gentlemen, what we need for future is a great vision a leadership that understands human behavior, that can make people work together, good governance, and plan for sustainability, resources. Resources, I have a quick comment, then will be question and answer. Everywhere I've been to in Africa, people are very anxious to talk about foundations that are not here. I have gone through many lists of millionaires in Africa. I listed more than 10 or 12 in Ghana alone who are millionaires. I've gone through the lists of billionaires in the world, 20 of them. Africa is too rich to claim to be poor. Everything the world needs for its development, don't let them fool you. They are here in Africa including human power. Africans in the diaspora, they have made contribution to the diaspora. Some of you already know this. As I speak, we have more Ghanaian medical doctors in New York than we have in the whole of Accra. That's human capital. We let it go. Not because they don't love their country. We've got to do something about that. That's about the principles of Africanization. 
getting human power back to the continent. And the resources are here. And we can do it. I'm convinced we can win the future for African studies in Africa. Thank you for listening. If we need a community that uh, can promote sustainable uh, leadership and we, we, we need to talk in various cultures and also uh, learn each other's culture so that at least uh, we will be able to know the up and downs of, of, of those cultures and how we can use it to promote peace and also to resolve conflicts. And I wanted to know uh, more on that as we are living now into the, the situations that that the uh, but in Africa, Africa, we can see that sometimes conflict that will happen, uh, promoting the uh, peace among each other. We can talk the various cultures, and I want to know how uh, the way forward on this particular issue. But yes, even in Ghana here, we talk about it with the hope that the West will help. Africa, without Somalia, everyone is crying, there's no food. But yet, there is a person in Africa, which was a certain account. So what is the way forward, especially how can we use the state of Africa in promoting and achieving this? I'm a good white man, an African. <laughs> Prof, you highlighted leadership. And I would like to ask, how can Africans nurture the type of leaders who will be impatient and be satisfied with our current state of affairs towards winning their cause. Since the former said the black man is capable of managing his own affairs. He also said that freedom is not a commodity given to the enslaved upon a mere demand, but it is a shining trophy of a constant struggle and sacrifice. How do we nature our leaders? Thank you very much. These are very fascinating and very challenging questions. I was very concerned about African leadership. I wrote a book on it. I was here in Ghana even interviewing uh, the president at that particular time. I'm very passionate about leadership. I think if there's anything we have to do in this continent, leadership for me is priority. And I strongly recommend it to our AS to specialize on issues of leadership and governance. It's a very, very serious matter. I like these questions because they are all talking about the way forward. Promoting peace. It's difficult to promote peace without understanding. This is where the application of IAS comes in, of African studies. We have the knowledge, but we have to use that knowledge to create better understanding of who we are, what we are, and what we are capable of becoming. I can stand here and talk to you about many strategies for promoting it, but I know you want to have your dinner later on. Uh, there are many strategies. And we know what works. If you look at global history, we know what works. The problem we have is we always try to reinvent the wheel. Take what works and apply it. Within our own African history, we have a long history. This is the genesis of the human race. We didn't start living when the British came here, when the French came here. We are the greatest universities in human history. So what's the problem? Are we reading them enough? Are we being taught? Sometimes you don't always have to blame the teacher. Education requires that you as an individual find some way, some motivation, some passion to pursue your goal. That is why I'm embarking 
on the development of African presidential libraries. What can we learn from them? And promote presidential scholars. What lessons can we learn from them that we can use to move forward? If you don't know where we are, where we came from, it's very difficult to move forward. So understanding is critical, and that's knowledge production, but it also involves dissemination of the knowledge. There are ways our traditional leaders taught us on how to promote unity, how to promote understanding. We don't have to throw all that away in the name of modernity. We take what is bad from both systems, traditional, modern, and apply it and see what works, test it out about USA creation. That was the passion of Kamen Krumah and all the Pan-Africanists. Du Bois, George Padmore, Blyden, all of them, you know all their names. Jomo Kayanta. But we don't have that kind of leadership now. It doesn't mean that the need for African unity is not there. It's coming in pieces in pieces. Because of the Accra Conference, OAU was created, headquarters in Ethiopia. And now it's called AU. I don't know why. Maybe because we have EU, we have to become AU. I don't know. But we have AU that's supposed to be fostering collaboration, engagement, with different countries. I'm going to stop by just referring you. You will say, this is what professors do. In 2011, I wrote a book. It's called Winning the Future for Africa and the African Diaspora. If you haven't read it, look at it. I got geographers to help me repartition Africa. Instead of 56 countries that we have now, which came out of the Berlin Conference, I created 30 states, 30 states, countries, in the United States of Africa. It was very simple. We have countries that are less than a million people. They can survive. They are trying to. You have Togo right here, you have Kuduva. I say that's the part of Ghana. It become one country, not three. Somebody called me and said, you must be crazy. Don't you know that's Francophone, they speak French and we speak English? I said, what's wrong with that? I stayed in Switzerland for a couple of months. What do they have in Switzerland? They have the French side. I stayed in Zurich, the German side. The Italian side. Europe doesn't speak one language. So why are we worrying about that? People wanted to divide us, to make sure that there's no United States of Africa. They always argue, Africa has too many languages. They can't talk to each other. They cannot be united. But all these European countries are united. Look at Asia. You think everybody speaks the same Chinese in China? <laughs> I have placed in the, your name on the list on the four lines. It has been written Professor in the for you guys, right? So I want to know whether the you is it an African name that is silence? Or is it to be a professor in African history for 40 years? And probably you have an audience of American or African American students in your teaching. I think your name doesn't reflect any passion for African values that you have. And then, secondly, you were talking about the multidisciplinary approach to the study of African, to the study approach to African studies. I think if, like, the studies, African studies is the 
but later, like you have archaeology, sociology, and history, it will rather allow for a like, comprehensive study of the factual things, like you can find who, instead of studying all the aspects that they go. As I think it will be profound enough to studies of Africa. My name is Richard Alena, the author of the political science. Prof, I want to know what addition are you bringing to the chair? Thank you. In your delivery, uh, you set an example of the push uh, H1, H1N1 road and how that if an uh, African study, a scholar in African studies was a central coordinator engineers and been sitting around and discussing the way it went for the road and how we have avoided the many accidents we have on the road. I am asking how um, governments in Africa can be re aware of the security of African studies so we could possibly need to be cooperated in the achievements. Let me that's the book itself, but let me Make it very short. You is my African name, given to me by my dear mother. It is Ukworiche Mofe. Ukworiche Mofe is very long. It's Ishakri. I come from two small, what they call minority tribes in Nigeria. My mother is Ishakiri. My father is Urobo. And those two tribes didn't get along. They were always at each other's throat. So when they fell in love, they knew it couldn't survive where they were born. So they packed their load and went to Benin City, a neutral ground. I was born there and raised there. But my mother being Shekri, a very strong Baptist, she has a tradition of naming everybody by using the word God. Ukonshefme means I love, I need the love of God. That's what it means, Ukonshefme, I need the love of God. In my quest for my own personal identity, you can understand why that name changed. And my first name became Jacob. I'm a product of colonialism. When you are baptized, what happened? They give you your baptist name. And your first name becomes middle name or is forgotten. There are some Africans, there was a time I used to say, my name is J. Ukonshemufe God. But I could not escape God because God is also a British name. He has a history. My grandfather was Chief Ogeba, who was a slave dealer. Came from the Nana group, if you remember African history. And so my father, Gordon, was born at an industry where they were trading oil. And the owner of that industry was named Gordon, was a British man. And in remembrance of where my father was born, he was named after Gordon. And we, the children of Gordon, we refused to bear the name Ogeba because at that time in Nigerian history, it was not too useful to be traced to one who came from slaveholder. So we wanted that history to die. But my late brother Emmanuel became chief Ogeba before he died. He went back and claimed it. But for us, we just wanted to stay in modern uh, history. We are Gordon. And I'm, a lot of Americans ask me, did you change your name when you came to America? I said, no. This is the history of my family. And it's still there. Uh, unlike uh, Alex Haley, I knew where I was born. I didn't have to write a book about it. Eventually, I will. Uh, so I don't have to spend much of time trying to trace it. So I have that history. Now, the other question, so I don't forget. 
Can anybody remind me about leadership or what? Who asked the second question? I, I forgot what it is. I didn't write it down. Uh, but this was a long answer to, to Africa. Someone asked me this morning about the same question on the radio talk show. And I taught him how to pronounce the name three times. And because he's a fellow African, he caught on it very quickly. I need the love of God. I always do. Thank you very much, Professor Gordon, for those insightful issues that you've raised, challenging us to think about issues regarding our identity as Africans moving into the area of African studies. I'm not going to attempt to summarize what he said, except to make one or two comments of my own. I think part of the issue is that sometimes we don't value what we have as Africans. And because of that, we do not focus on studying who we are, what we are, and what we value. On the area of cultural competence, it amazes me without end whenever I see what I call the color crisis. Now, depending on your cultural background, certain colors mean certain things. From the culture I come from, and I guess for most of the cultures in this country, black generally symbolizes mourning state of sorrow. But these days you find young people and they're wearing black and then you ask them, are you bereaved? And then they would ask you, why are you asking me that question? And then I tell them, it's because you are in black. They say, oh, no, it's because I like it and I like the color. There is also the area of language, which is my area of interest because of my background in linguistics. Another area of cultural competence that somehow I think we're gradually, gradually losing the war. And when I spoke here roughly a year ago, I made that same point where we have children growing up in this country with parents who speak the same language, and those children are not speaking the language that the parents speak. So there is a crisis. And this is where the issue of leadership that Professor Gordon talked about comes into play. Leadership in our, in our curriculum design, leadership in the classroom, leadership in civil society. I also want to express the gratitude of the university to Anglo Gold Ashanti for the support they have given for the establishment of the Kwame Nkrumah Chair. We greatly appreciate this combination of private capital and the area of African studies. And we're hoping that this chair will survive a long time to come so that the, grand, the great grandchildren and beyond of Osajifu will come and experience what you've done. So thank you very much, Anglo Gold Ashanti. <clears throat> On that note, ladies and gentlemen, let me say thank you to all of you for coming. We are very grateful that you came. Thank you very much. I'm here to perform a simple but an important duty, that is to say thank you to all of you. Let me start by saying thank you to God for giving us life to see this day. And on behalf of the new Kwame Nkrumah Chair, Professor Emeritus Jacob Gordon, the Director of the Institute of African Studies, I want to say thank you to the Vice-Chancellor 
for having time with us today. We want to thank our traditional leaders who had to travel long distances to be here with us. We acknowledge the presence of dignitaries from Anglo Gold Ashanti. We thank them for their support. We thank Odessria and all our donors. And to our media friends, we say thank you. The Director of Public Affairs and her staff, we are grateful to you for organizing this function. And to all other members of the university community who spent your afternoon and evening with us, we are grateful. We thank all of you for coming. Thank <laughs> you.